Welcome to the GreenPill.network podcast. If you're just joining us, we're building a coordination, a network society of thousands of hackers, dreamers, and doers using crypto to bring positive sum digital systems to the world. This podcast features the people who are doing it. We publish a season of about a dozen episodes every couple months. This season is all about lean, mean capital allocation machines. What are the ways in which we're going to do capital allocation in a different way than was possible before we had the on-chain primitives that we now have? And we are exploring the possibilities of capital allocation in an on-chain world in this season. One special thing we are doing this season is we are allowing you to collect this episode. All episodes during the season are available on-chain. If you go to pods.media slash green pill to find the episodes and start collecting, you can do that today. Thank you to jtnickel.eth, hal.eth, 0xLucas, Simons SD, SkyDow, James.eth, and MMA on-chain for being our top collectors this season. If you want to learn more about the Green Pill podcast, you can visit our website at thegreenpill.network where you can download the Green Pill book for free, join the Discord, and become a member of your local chapter. All right. My guest today is Austin Griffith. He is a builder, a builder in the Ethereum ecosystem and the founder of Build Guild, which you can kind of think of as a developer collective that is helping onboard more developers into the Web3 space. So Austin is behind a bunch of prolific things in the space. He built Punk Wallet. He built Scaffold ETH. He built Speedrun Ethereum. He built ETH.Build. And uh, he is known for his uh, Bowtie Fridays, which is where he live streams all of the re- recent builds he's working with on Friday wearing a bow tie. That's what Bowtie Friday is. Austin is also a Gitcoin alumni. Him and I worked together back in the 2018 and 2019 cycle, and uh, we've just been friends ever since. I think he's on the frontier. He's one of my favorite people to talk to in the space about what's going on and what are the cool, new, interesting things that are happening, and uh, also just a fun, nice guy to know. So this was a fun episode to talk to Austin Griffith about Build Guild, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Austin, what's up? Happy Bowtie Friday. Thanks for having me. Happy Bowtie Friday. For those of us who are watching on video, Austin's wearing a bow tie. And on screen, he's flexing his validator behind him, which is looks like validating blocks. No, that's just a ref node. This one, so the one at home is, but it's kind of like, you know, uh, PsyOps. I don't know if I should say where my actual validator is and where it is not, but there's always a node okay. in the background. At least. That's great keeping track of the chain and sharing it with others peer to peer. That's great. And then the other thing that's on screen right now, and you and I have a tradition is that you like to bring the energy by doing some sort of arm movement on chain. Yes. And we, okay. So that's how we awkwardly, I can't, yep. I can't quite. Yep. Do no, it. no, no. It's I'm more like, like this. Yeah. 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 No more, more like this. Yeah. I can't explain to the audio <laughs> listeners what's going on on screen. <laughs> right it's now. Real, have to- it's awkward. You guys got to trust us. All right, so we're we're here to talk about capital allocation. You're one of my favorite capital allocation machine builders in the space, Austin. So um, the 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 framing of this season of Green Pill is capital allocation machines. We're going to do more scalable, precise, and democratic capital allocation that's ever than than was possible off chain. We're going to do more scalable, precise capital allocation on chain. And so I want to talk about some of the stuff that you and I have built together, capital allocation machines, and then also what's in the Vanguard at the Build Guild. So maybe we'll just start with what's the Build Guild and and what are you all focused on? Yeah. So the Build Guild is a Wyoming DAO LLC officially, uh, but technically it's a (laughs) multi-sig. And that money, so money comes in from large organizations like the EF and Optimism Retro PGF. And we uh, reallocate that money in small chunks to developers that are up and coming, high impact on the edge. Uh, We do that through Speedrun Ethereum, which is our developer onboarding and education, kind of our curriculum. Scaffold ETH is like our prototyping and app building tool. And then grants.buildguild and buildguild as a whole is kind of like our capital allocation mechanism. I can kind of think of what you're building as a capital allocation machine that brings more developers into crypto. So the meme is speedrun Ethereum. Go to speedrunethereum.com and you see Austin doing videos about how to build Solidity. And then as people go through the videos and they complete challenge requests, they get dropped into Telegram channels. And at the advanced levels, they're actually helping you build speedrun Ethereum. Like they're laying the tracks as they're coming in. 
And so you're yeah, you're like kind of like the Pied Piper of software developers in the space. <laughs> yeah, good good reference. Yeah, I. <laughs> Oh yeah, I don't know if any Gen Zers will know what the Pied Piper is. Yeah, but, middle middle uh, out uh, middle out compression. Yeah. So did I get that right about so Speedrun Ethereum is like the front door, and then Build Guild is is the people who are building Speedrun Ethereum, but they've all come through Speedrun Ethereum, or a lot of them have come through, you know, just like your your social presence also, but mostly Speedrun Ethereum. There, there's this weird so Speedrun Ethereum really helps you figure out how to build, but also what to build, like kind of goes through the things that you would build. But there's still this kind of tour of duty you have to do after you understand what to build and how to build it. There's just this kind of valley of despair that you just have to ship a bunch of things on the tech tree to really understand what's going to work and get more context for the space and figure out what people want and kind of where the moving target is in terms of what the UX has to be on the app and things like that. So there's this middle territory where we're really trying to nurture this, just get in a routine, get in a rhythm of shipping small apps and trying things and something fun will come from that. And and we try to just, you know, nurture that and incentivize that a little bit kind of in the middle after they're done with the curriculum. And I think that like a lot of the developers that I come across have been in that sort of like liminal space with you. And that's like part of their journey into the space. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious. I'm curious how y'all are rewarding the developers that are coming in through Build Guild. Y'all just launched Build, Build Guild grants. Maybe that's the the thread to pull. Heck yeah, yeah. No, grants is you know first and foremost a product we need in house because we have folks coming through the speed run and then eventually getting into these Build Guild batches. We have this batch program. You know, each every few weeks, everybody that finished the speed run that wants to be part of this is kind of part of this. We, we circle up around a repo and we work on this repo and that helps with, with a lot of things there. But the, there was this, there was this gap basically in build guild where if I found you and I saw that you were building awesome things and I had a good gut feeling about you, I would just like allocate a stream of ETH to you. And then from then on, you would build things and withdraw from that thing, from that stream and turn in the things you're building. But that's a heck of a commitment to, to set up with someone. And we, we needed some middle territory and that, was our grants program. So it's sort of like, as you finish the curriculum, you're getting in the mode of shipping. We want to just incentivize that with tiny ETH grants. So 0.125 ETH to start and 0.125 ETH when you ship. And we do that a couple times with folks getting them just in the, in the routine of shipping. And then if you keep doing that for a long time, maybe there's a stream in there also, but that's the, like the main allocation mechanism I think is now moving toward this grant system because it allows us to build a feedback loop up without having a huge commitment to, to funding a builder full-time. Yeah. What I think is interesting here is, is that you're pioneering a different way of hiring people than we're going to do a bunch of job interviews and then maybe a challenge program. And then I'm going to do a reference checks and then we're going zero to 60 you're hired full time. You're more like, hey, I had a good a call with you. I Rarely. I like your vibe. Here's a stream. Uh, you're welcome to withdraw the stream, but you're gonna have to self-report what you're what you're building in order to get the stream. And then you're kind of like emergently building up trust over time by doing work together instead of like talking for a long time about what it would be like to do work together and then going zero to sixty really quick. So. Uh, I've just sort of admired the the emergence, how you're embracing emergence in your capital allocation in the Build Guild. That's a great way to frame it. And it, you make it sound really good, but obviously there's a lot of messy things here. There's lots of like people working nights and weekends and people getting things 80% of the way done, right? There's a lot of like, yeah. you're on your own educational journey here. And I'm going to give you this, like, I need this Merkle tree and this other project. Could you build this? And it would be a sweet combo move for something else. But like, you know, it's a dice roll whether or not I'm going to get that thing delivered the way I need to. So if so, we're, we can't just be like we're not a typical dev shop. It just doesn't work that way because too many things go on the shelf, and we're about education and building. But there is kind of this weird combo move where things do get shipped now and then, which is pretty fun. Yeah, and and you know, I'm curious, what what are the numbers that you're putting up here? How many people are coming through Speedrun Ethereum? How many people do you have on these on these drip? Uh, these drip campaigns, you know, what sort of scale is this capital allocation machine working at? It, it's pretty rad that all of this stuff is on chain and we can go look at it, but I don't, I don't look yeah. at it as regularly as I should. For 2023, we had 10,000 people do uh, start Speedrun Ethereum. I think we had 1,000 people finish Speedrun Ethereum and join Build Guild. 
And then uh, with our whole budget, we funded 150 total people within the year of mm-hmm. 2023. So that kind of gives you the, the scale down to you know, the, the funnel. But remember, a lot of these folks are just learning everything they need quietly and anonymously and ejecting out. And we never have any clue they came through. And I just see them at a hackathon one day and they're like, hey, I just built this DeFi protocol. I got into the space yeah. because of this stuff and I have no idea. So this is only the people that are kind of like really sticking around that are making it through this funnel. And it's okay if people don't make it through this funnel. Yeah, I think that's it's sort of interesting is that, so the mechanism is that you stream the money, but they have to withdraw the stream publicly once a week or once a month or oh, that's what it used to be yes is that is that no this is a really good thing to get into for sure yes uh and, and yeah. especially when we're talking about capital allocation mechanisms because there is something that we did mm-hmm. differently sorry did you want to get into that first or should i no you explain it you're the mastermind behind it so the smart contract works in a really interesting way where when i deploy you a stream the money's there from the start and it's basically your money because only your address can withdraw from it but if you think of it like a battery that's that just basically gets full and stays full, and then as you withdraw from it, it'll go down and then charge back up to the full state again. It's kind of a weird pattern, but what this creates is both I trust you and there's money here for you from the get-go. But on a, on a second piece, your nights and weekends, you're maybe not working for full-time stuff here. You're going to disappear and you're allowed to disappear and you're that's okay. And so some of these streams will fill up and just stay full and be paused full. And it's kind of a weird, if you think about it, like that's not totally like a stream because the stream pauses and it's not streaming to me when I'm not doing something. But that's kind of the key mechanism I wanted here is people can check out for a few months and then the stream is waiting for you when you get back, but I'm not constantly streaming to you when you're not building things. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's it's not like a trustless system that you built. It's almost like a trust minimized system. If people want to take the cookie out of the cookie jar, they got to leave a note saying yep. what they did and they know they're going to have to face you and you're kind of like a hero to them, whether you'll admit it or not. And so this creates a mechanism where people will only withdraw the cookie from the cookie jar if, if they have something to show for it. it has that been something that's like, enforced socially is there anyone that's taken advantage of that because i just want to address like the absolute trust minimalization zealots that are out there that think that oh this will be abused like here's all the different ways it could be abused oh yeah it can be abused in a lot of ways uh but i think this is as much dog fooding as it is anything right like Mm -hmm. the the allocation mechanism here is is working in a lot of good ways but of course you could game it and i think since Allocation mechanisms are something that you you really geek out on. I think that it should be kind of noted here that this mechanism sort of is rewarding the bad people and kind of leaving the good people behind because the really best people don't want to get in and turn in their work. They're terrible at pricing things. It's, yeah. it's almost like this social filter for me figuring out how someone goes about using their stream in the first place of kind of like what kind of a builder they are and what kind of personality they are. And you can see it in the mechanism. And I just like, I totally view this as like, dang it. Like (laughs) I keep building these fun little mechanisms, but then like, this is obviously something that a bad person would take advantage of and a good person would have a hard time using. And that's something to really kind of face and sit with. I feel like we've, we're kind of in this uncanny valley where we know that the whole job interview reference check, zero to full-time thing doesn't work. There's been so many examples for me of times in which that's not worked out. And um, we're trying to invent new mechanisms for hiring people that can do better than that. But it, it feels like you've not yet reached the place where this is serious enough where someone can be full-time at Build Guild. This is more just kind of like a fun, cute way of pushing them down the funnel, getting them interested in Web3. They probably stick around a whole lot more when they get one of these streams, but it's not like they're going to work full-time for Build Guild forever like with the with these streams. But it seems like the life cycle of a lot of these people is that they end up working in the ecosystem, either on their own projects or getting hired full-time. So we're in this uncanny valley where we know traditional hiring is broken and there's probably a better way to do it. And you figured out a way to do capital allocation that pulls people down the funnel of doing Web3 capital allocation, but you haven't really fully replaced the whole elephant of of hiring. Any response to that? Is that fair? Uh, yeah, sure. I think that there is, like if we look at people build guild fund in 2023 or whatever, if we look at that 150 people, there's for sure like a long tail of people that didn't get very much money. And there's for sure like a body of people that made part-time. But I think there may be 
six, seven people that are like full-time build guild now. And that's from, you know, all of our grants and all of our budget has to fund those folks and the middle folks and the long tail of folks. And one person at the head means, you know, 20 people at the tail. And so it's, it's hard to justify sometimes having full-time people, but I do have, like, I would say maybe like five or six full-time folks. It's not like paper contracts drawn out, but there's a smart contract drawn out that, that lays that out and you can see what they're making annually and it's a close is it is it just a salary it's a salary it's not like a fang okay. salary but it's a salary all right oh man i brought you on chain or uh, on the episode to talk about on chain capital allocation you just brought salaries on chain. <laughs> <laughs> i yeah i think and this is a new way of doing it doing it uh withdrawal based for a while but then you i think you got to switch you got to switch over to okay i trust you this needs to be full-time if you're full-time full-time I'm going to turn on like a llama stream or sablier and it's going to just flow to you. And it probably in a stable yeah. coin, I think is what we're seeing. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's sort of like, when I think about the full timer space, you obviously at that point you've vetted their culture or fit, you vetted their ability to contribute. And there, there's also sort of like a, it's not only how are you doing capital allocation to them, but it's who are you competing against? And if you're competing against all the other web three orgs that are offering salaries and benefits, then there's sort of a different dynamic there once you get to that high trust level. And so the market sets the expectation there for you. Um, but, you know, uh, I'll be curious to see, we'll have you back in 2025 and, and see how your team has grown and, and how many people are at the mid, late and early stages of the build guild funnel. I need better numbers too. I'll, I'll, I'll come with, I'll come with graphs next time. We did have you on Green Pill a year ago, and um, one difference I'll note between then and now is that back then, I think y'all were being funded primarily by the EF, but now you're getting retroactive public goods funding. So just diversifying the sources of funding at the top of the funnel is is something that I think is neat. It's definitely uh, a stress reliever for me. It's kind of an existential thing to have a, one big grant be the thing that controls your entire organization and your ability to fund 150 people. And so it's scary, but it's, you know, the, the, I was doing it with my own money right up until I ran out of money. And that's when the EF like helped out. So without that big grant from the EF to start, like I would not be here, but yes, it's so, uh, it's so uh, relaxing to not have that existential dread of a single actor funding you at least if it's like two or three different actors and even the retro pgf round was just like one round and we'll see from here but that's it's enough to run on for for a year plus well um i'd love to just open up the aperture of the episode to ask what you're excited about um and again the hypothesis behind season four of green pill is capital allocation machines how can we do weird, fun, interesting capital allocation, but like the general hypothesis is more precise, more scalable capital allocation, probably more democratic than was possible off chain. What are you excited about in the ecosystem? What do you want to mess around with? And uh, yeah, where's your head at when you, when, when I bounce that hypothesis off you? So, yeah, I mean, first of all, things I'm excited about, we have a lot of cool things happening. L2s, Bob's getting cheaper, account abstraction. Yeah. Uh, basically we're, we're setting up for a new era of blockchain users that are spending pennies and they're coming out of their like American Coinbase wallet to go spend pennies to buy DGEN or something like that. And that's really exciting because a lot of those folks will also, you know, dip into the developer life a little bit and understand what deploying a contract is and all of that stuff. So I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited for the new set of users, but specifically in terms of capital allocation and funding, I go back to the the early Kevin Owaki who is dinking around with GitHub and tokens and stuff like that. I think that we will have lots of new developers enter the space that will go, mm. oh, open source incentives, like open source incentives, Ethereum. Yep. Ethereum open source incentives. And we see support programs baked into GitHub, but I don't know if they're the best yet. And I think way more capital will flow in when a good mechanism is created. Yeah. And I think any old developer can pull scaffold ETH off the shelf or pull some scripts off the shelf and build something that can go read GitHub and figure out who the contributors are and mint a token mm-hmm. to those people. You need you know, a few weeks of learning about Ethereum to be able to get to build a script that d- deploys a token to contributors to your repo. And I think that's coming. And I think more developers are going to find that. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah. Early Gitcoin was all about open source software sustainability. And the vision was because I was an open source software developer and wasn't getting paid for it. 
What if we could use crypto to fund it? And, um, you know, Gitcoin sort of moved into this other space of public goods funding and quadratic funding. And it's neat to see that space be occupied by a bunch of new entrants in the space that like T.XYZ and Radical, I'm really excited about. Yeah, Optimism yep. is it is interesting just for, yeah, drips. Uh, Optimism is interesting just for the sheer amount of money it's that crazy. they're plowing into open yeah. source builders. And, uh, and then, of course, like around Optimism, you get this this network of impact measurers like Carl and Open Source Observer so cool. that are actually measuring it. And, um, you know, the last thing I'll say is that Vital- Vitalik, when I did an interview with him in December, said, focus on open source software, not only because it's it's one of the most underfunded public goods, governments aren't typically funding global public goods like open source, but also it's the foundation upon which crypto ecosystems rely, open source software. And also, it's kind of a Trojan horse into the mainstream if we can figure out a way to fund traditional open source builders. So yeah, just curious to see what happens this cycle with people building. Oh, and it's it's also completely digital. So as opposed to the Oracle problem you have with funding like climate public goods with with open source, you have all this data on on GitHub and and Git repositories you can use. So yeah, it's a very fruitful place. And um, and I'll be curious to see who moves into that space and, and really becomes the like web three github um i think that there's a lot of opportunity that be there because of all the reasons that we just listed yeah i mean like and the obvious person is microsoft and i don't know if they want to do like no. there's booms and busts and nft bros and so much garbage in the space that it's hard even if you were microsoft and you did have a way of doing token funding on an l2 when do you launch it and how much shit do you get from all the turds yeah. about it <laughs> I, I don't you're gonna it's gonna come from microsoft okay a like i went to github universe back in like 2018 back when gitcoin was trying to enter this space and i remember open source sustainability just felt like it was a side quest for them they were locked into this like goliath versus goliath battle with gitlab for enterprise adoption and they couldn't like you know open source sustainability was good for the virtue signaling for them but i didn't get a sense that it was like they were plowing a ton of money into it and also these days when i think microsoft i think oh they're plowing money into ai and that's that's where they're playing so I think that who, the, like the 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 next open source funding model is going to come from Web three in a bottoms up organic way. It's going to come from the T dot X Y Zs or the radicals or the optimisms or maybe the Gitcoins. I, I don't know, but um, I think it's going to be like more bottoms up and organic. It's going to look more like David than than Goliath would be my counterpoint to that. Great, and we're building the tools for those people, the tools and the education for any developer to come in and like figure yeah. out how to build these kinds of systems, like. It's doable. If you're an intelligent person, you can land on speedrun Ethereum and technically get the aha moments very quickly and get to writing scripts and apps and finding these funding mechanisms. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm curious to see, is there going to be one killer app? Is it, is it going to be bounties or is it going to be grants hmm. uh, or is it going to be t.xyz or is it going to be a summation of a bunch of small tools, Unix philosophy style that all compose together and will an open source software developer's income stream come from one big airdrop or one big income stream? Or is it going to come from a bunch of different small places? I'm, I'm feeling like this, the cleanest solution, the one I want it to be <laughs> as someone who wants to earn money here is like the one big thing. But the, the solution I think is actually going to happen is a bunch of small crypto economic rewards coming from a bunch of different places that might be a little bit of a headache to track and, and manage. But I, I feel like that pluralistic thing is way is, is more realistic, but also more anti-fragile. I think about Anish and I think he's tweeted famously that he got in to the space by like Sybil attacking some airdrop or something like that. And he was like, Anish, the, the, yeah, from Paradigm. yeah. Yeah. And he, yeah. he, he, he like literally moved up the hierarchy of needs because of crypto and stuck around because of it. And yeah. he even came and worked with you guys for a while. Like you tricked him into building a few yeah. things uh, at Gitcoin for a while. <laughs> Before he was a big deal, exactly. yeah, he was doing builds. Uh, he's like on my list of like builders that I'm really proud to have helped discover. It. It's like you and Carl Carbone and and Anish are like early, early Gitcoin ecosystem contributors that are now on to bigger and greater things. But uh, yeah, discovering up and coming talent it was was sort of like one of the side effect blessings of being involved in Gitcoin early. But this this idea that like onboarding isn't going to come through this obvious, like, come work here because of the incentives. It's more like, 
do something slightly shady and go up the high, move up the hierarchy of needs and then realize how cool that is and then build more things. And then you get in, you know, yeah. there, there is this, uh, like I, I could program money. So I should certainly be able to make money doing that, that kind of draws people mm-hmm. in. But then once they're here, the ethos and the technology and so much, so many other things, you almost feel bad mm-hmm. that you came in with such a economic mind, I guess, but, or yeah, yeah. I, with that, with those uh, incentives, but you stick around and you stay and there's a lot of really interesting things along with all yeah, so of these grifts. There's this, um, this concept called skeuomorphism, which is basically like how much does the digital resemble the analog? Um, and, and I think that like, this is an example of the non skeuomorphism of jobs, which is like, it's not going to just be a salary yeah. on chain. It's going to be earning in a whole bunch of weird on chain mechanisms that didn't couldn't have existed in the old world. And and that's the horizon that like this season of Green Pill I'm trying to peek over and take the whole audience with with me is like peeking over that horizon of what is on chain capital allocation gonna look like. And yeah, maybe there's a clue in last cycles frontiersmen and frontiers women uh like the anishas and the you like the 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 people who are who are really doing the stuff that's that's in the frontier and um and and it's about scaling that or like pushing the frontier of that in a way that wasn't possible before we had l2s and account abstraction i don't know you can like reason about what's over the frontier but until we go over it it's hard to say for sure it's crazy like we build all these tools and all these things and Maybe the thing that gets mass adoption is not something that's going to use any of these current wallets that we're all dog fooding and it'll be something else. And that could happen. That's, you know, likely probably. Um, well, what else, what else are you excited about? Oof, that's tough. I so like builders, like the ability to build. So I was uh, on stage at uh, ETH Global London and I built mm-hmm. an app in 25 minutes or something like that start to finish built an app that was like a delegator smart contract that you can control with an ownership pattern first of all the fact that you can do that with tooling these days is really cool like you can go from zero to one so fast but when i hit deploy and it cost two cents the room lit up and that was really neat to be able to pay two cents to deploy a smart contract to uh, yeah, cool. a blockchain secured by Ethereum is really cool. That was base. And it actually just cost me $9 to deploy to base just like 30 minutes ago. So it, the blob scription stuff has come in and priced the blob market higher. So it's a lot more expensive, but as we scale, mm-hmm. the, those prices will go back down. Yeah, so so here's one way to reason about what's over that frontier is that before you could only do transactions that were like ten or like fifty dollars, and we've all seen the memes of people complaining about that because they didn't know about L twos, and uh, and now that the median transaction is like a couple cents, then not only does that make it Web three more accessible to people who are not as privileged as as some of the first world builders are. But also it enables a whole bunch of other use cases that are lower price points. And one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of interesting in, I'd love to get your take on this, is what happens when social networks build in? For real. I mean, we're seeing mechanisms. It. Like, yeah. Imagine a, a Twitter where every like you get is worth a dollar. And, and it's not like an on-chain signal that, and, and, and maybe we can even add quadratic funding so that each like can be added up quadratic funding. And like all of a sudden you're earning from your social media. I feel like Stani and Lens are really pushing the frontier of what happens when you take capital allocation mechanisms and put them onto social networks. And obviously Farcaster blew up in the last few months. And so th- there's stuff like that's go- that's going to be possible that, that wasn't possible before. Does that bring up anything for you? No, for real. I, I think that like when we talk about Web3 and uh, the internet, all I was seeing was meme coins. Uh, uh, to see something like Farcaster or Warpcaster, the app, take off and not just take off, but there's new paradigms even within these apps like Farcaster Frames, which is just like the Twitter card. Like when you paste a link that uh, to speedrun Ethereum, like a little Twitter card comes down and it's a nice little picture. This is speedrun Ethereum. But in Farcaster mm-hmm. Frames, they unfurl that and they give you a little bit more metadata. You can put some buttons in there. You can control the cards. It's almost like this little hyper card thing if, if you're yeah. f- from way back in the day. And so it allows you to make a little a app. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. For, uh, for 1990s the, for multimedia older, kids. <laughs> older millennials like yes. me in Austin, HyperCard was a way that if you couldn't code, you could compose these little like RPG games by just editing the text on the screen and hooking up little logical yep. circuits to them. And that's what frames so, is like, like a card. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So basically now there's the ability to do like really basic coding mechanisms, really basic capital allocation mechanisms without 
doing any coding and you know what kind of stuff are people going to invent now that it's not just the privileged people who can code that are doing it but it's anyone yeah and social is showing that and we're seeing uh people come on chain and build cool things and use these frames in a new way uh thanks to the farcaster protocol being open-ended and being permissionlessly extensible and all of the you know things that make web3 and going on chain cool the composability layer and so just by enabling that extra special little unfurl a whole like you know market of things took off of weird things where people were were one click ordering girl scout cookies and stuff like that like using a wallet like a coinbase commerce wallet to buy girl scout cookies from a single frame with a single clip and you could i as the builder i could make the frame and then you could take the frame and add things to it and unfurl it on your page and it would show things custom to you mm -hmm. so there was just like tons of composability and it was just an unfurl it's just a twitter card it's just the unfurl it's the simplest mechanism but by putting the web three framing on it where anybody can build anything, then it got really interesting. And we saw lots of cool contributions come in and that's what this new web is going to be about. Yeah. So it feels like by lowering the transaction cost of each transaction in these L2s, there's going to be this liminal space of cap of casual social interactions through which we can attach capital allocation. That would be my distillation of the of the thesis here is in casual spaces, exchanging a couple dollars in that liminal space will now be possible. Heck yeah. And, and like a few pennies to your downstream dependencies add up to millions of dollars. Sometimes yeah. if we think about the one developer from Nebraska and how we fund them, you know, some mechanism, some, some developer from Nebraska will deploy a smart contract system that will have all the dependencies funded correctly somehow through uh, you know, these organizations that give out money and then dis dis different distribution mechanisms and funding that person who is building all the open source stuff that's getting used by everyone and not getting paid for. So like your Nebraska yeah. example, yeah, it'll yeah. raise you plus one, which is what if that person is in Hyderabad? It's, if you've ever tried to send international wire, it's a fucking nightmare. Uh, so I'll, I'll just one up you by saying you don't even have to be in America to use these things, which... We just take for granted in Web3 right. that you could send money, but uh, I recently tried to send an international wire to a contributor from India, and we're still trying to trace where the money went. <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's another thing with these streams is it's like completely hands off from me. I find you, I connect you to the stream, you work on it and withdraw from it, and the money gets to you, and it's like very hands off from me, and we have worldwide builders. That 150 people would, you know, cover the map pretty well. Yeah. Well, it's too bad Web3 doesn't have a use case. <laughs> we're, we're still working on it. <laughs> we still don't know. No, no, no. I think, I think that is there is a truth to that is we still don't know exactly what this new type of computing is going to be, like what the final form of the application and the use case is of this new type of computing. But that happens with every new type of computing. When we first got a personal computer and we first got mobile phones, when we first got the internet, we dinked around with it a lot and did a lot of weird things. And we didn't know exactly yeah. what it was for. And I think we're in that same stage with Ethereum and blockchains. Um, another space that I'd love to explore with you is uh, we talked about that like sort of casual liminal space of like, hey, I just met you. I'm going to put you on a stream or, hey, we're in a social network together and I'm going to give you a dollar or two. Um, but I'm interested in exploring the opposite end of that spectrum, which is like multi-year relationships. So, you know, the evolution of trust, I, I think, is like really possible when there's positive sum games and low miscommunication and people have re repeated interactions with each other. Right. If I fuck you over then you're not going to do work with me and there's no repeat interactions. But, you know, in these spaces where people have multi-year relationships, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for 3-3 three, three to, to coordinate with each other. And, um, you know, you and I have been through a couple cycles and, and I'm wondering, like, you know, is, is there anything you see opportunities for in, in as people build up more reputation over time to leverage that? And I guess the other thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, one of the things we talked about is like, what if there was like a Gitcoin alumni network where people could do token swaps with each other? I mean, Bill Gill could do this also. Um, what if DAOs could do token swaps with each other? What are the ways in which um, my success can be your success after we've both, you know, our, the, the relationship starts with more of like the casual social thing, but then it progresses over time as we just like don't fuck each other over I think over the course of multiple years. Like, is there anything in, in that design space that you've got your eye on? I think that long-term relationships 
for me, on chain sort of get get as far as like the llama stream or something, and we don't go any farther than that. Like that's the that's the highest tier relationship you can have with me is that I'm streaming you money from Llama Pay. But I think that there's this obvious thing that you're pulling at here that every single developer that comes through the build guild should have some token representing them and their success in some way. And and the batch that they were in, that batch should have a token and there should be some shared success within the batch of people. And then the build guild itself should have a token. And all of these should be like interrelated in some way economically. And as some random person is helped by three build guild members and they make their way through and they end up building something awesome and then contributing some retro PGF funding back to build guild, that should be split to those people somehow. So I think it's like, there's something obvious there and, and something awesome that could happen, but I, I don't know. We'll see. I think that you've got all the components to explore that. You've got the 150 people in Build Guild. You're all messing around with stuff on chain. And there's a lot of positive some relationships. So curious to see where that goes. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully it's 300 next year. But got to double the budget somehow. Some Figure something yeah. out. <laughs> well, it's, it's a bull market. You can do better That's than, right. uh, than double. You go exponential. That's right. You, meme coin or you can fund the Build Guild. The Build Guild is funding developers on the edge. Hit us up with a yeah. grant. And we will re-give that grant out in small pieces to awesome people that need it and are building awesome things on the edge. We only have a few minutes left, so I'll move to my final question, which is uh, in a world in which you're maximally successful over the next five or 10 years, besides fist bumps, yes. what, uh, what, is it, what does it look like? Paint us a picture of a world maximum in which you're successful. Yeah, I think maximum success. So, so there's this interesting thing where no matter how hard I work, only a certain amount of users or builders or developers are going to come into Ethereum. And if I'm trying to onboard developers, I'm sort of at the mercy of this flow of people in a way. And what I've tried to frame is that the bull market will cause people to come in and it's my job to bring them down the rabbit hole as fast as possible. Because what we yeah. find at the Gitcoin thing, the electric coin capital, uh, Maria Shen showed this off, right? It was like basically developers that are in stay in and developers that are kind of on the surface they leave when when the price goes down and i would say there's a few key moments there that have to happen you've got to give them some eth you've got to give them the education you've got to kind of get them deploying something on mainnet and figuring it out but i think my job is to make that happen and get more people in and have more people stick so i think 10 years from now would be the people who came to learn more about ethereum found out about it and built a bunch of really cool products and now it's there's mainstream users using Ethereum, whether they know it or not. And it's more of like a settlement layer. And we have L2s and L3s and people are all on chain and things like uh, censorship and things like inflation. Lots of these things that like blockchain should probably fix. I don't know a ton about, but I'm assuming that they will, you know, global geopolitical things. Perhaps we're talking about nation states playing some of these coordination games that we're building. There's there's a lot of interesting things there, uh, and I want to help the next generation of builders that are going to build those apps be successful and learn and create and ship. Yeah, it feels like what you've kind of built is this onboarding shelling point where maybe you come into crypto for your own reasons, but you find Austin, you start following his Pied Piperness, and he leads you down a regen rabbit hole, but also gives you the skills that you need to provide value and one of the things that that I think that's coolest about Build Guild is the fact that it's like a self-building machine. These builders are helping you build speedrun Ethereum, but also it's positive ripples propagate outwards because you're just onboarding developers into the space that are that are building cool new stuff. And they also have this network of relationships with each other. So I, I think the second order effects of Build Guild are gonna be quite well, they could be quite massive over the ten year time time frame. Hope so. All right. Well, that's that's all the questions I have for you. Is there anything you didn't ask? Uh, didn't ask that you want to say? Oh yeah. What are the questions we should be asking? What What are the next on chain apps going to look like? I think social was close. I think uh, like prediction markets are getting a little hotter. Right. You got anything uh, that you're excited about? Token curated registries? Anything like that? Yeah. No. My secret is that I'm I'm not that smart. I just surround myself with the <laughs> same, smart people. Same. And yes, of course. Ask them to be on my podcast same. and they tell me. But, <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know, like, I, I think that every cycle, it, it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right? And what I'm interested in doing is is drawing a line from what happened last cycle, and you can kind of like look linearly outwards, but then you can reason from first principles about, okay, now we have L2, so cheaper transactions, 
and now we have account abstraction and also LRTs and social are happening. And so you can draw, like it, it becomes a bunch of data points and then you can sort of draw linear trend lines from each of them. But every once in a while, there's something that, that comes out of the Merc that just surprises you, like meme coins. Like, I guess I'm just not left curve enough or right curve enough to have anticipated <laughs> meme coins. So, so yeah, I mean, every once in a while you get surprised, but then you update your model, right? All, all models are wrong or some are useful. So I'm just hanging out and, and listening and observing and, and, and trying to build value. And, and that's my formula, but I don't know what's next. If I knew what's next, I, uh, uh, I probably would have been grinding on this whole like public goods <laughs> capital allocation thing for seven years. But we kind of know where it's going. With account abstraction, people can use it. Like my mom can use it. With uh, with L2s, it's cheap enough that a lot more things can come on yeah. chain. So a lot of games and digital things and all sorts of like registries are big right now, right? Like a, a registry on Ethereum makes a lot of sense. ENS is a good starting yeah. point, but EAS and lots of attestation services and stuff are pretty cool too. And those are popping up and then all the social shit what, what, and all the L2 thing? stuff. Yep. One thing that I see as like a commonality with you is like kind of like serving the people who are on the frontier. There's there's this whole thing about, you know, when you're going west, don't like actually try to mine gold, but sell big pickaxes to the gold the gold miners. And like, I kind of think Build Guild is doing that because like everyone's going to need developers, right? Um, and in a way, Gitcoin's doing that also because Gitcoin Grants is now available for any EVM-based ecosystem. So regardless of whether the meta is like meme coins or LRTs or LSTs, people are going to need grants programs and quadratic funding is a really cool way to run a, a grants program. Of course, Gitcoin's now doing retro PGF and a bunch of other stuff too now, but like you, you kind of don't have to be on like the frontier of the latest meme coin meta when you're selling the tools to the people who are, are on the frontier. And, and I see that that has a commonality between my work and your work. I like to use the tools and show them off anyways, just a little bit. So I imagine me as like, uh, like I bought a plot of land just outside of town where everyone has to walk by when they're headed to their good plot of land. And I sit there with my really nice tool and I chop, chop, chop. But then I like I sprinkle some fake gold on it now and then as people walk by. <laughs> so like, I'm not really building like production level stuff, but you can with this tool. And that's what I'm trying to show people as they, they're walking by. So I do a little bit of knucklehead building, but not production level, I don't think. Yeah. And the other meta that that I'm sort of seeing between me and you is like, when Gitcoin 1.0, I built a lot of the tech myself and I was like really rage coding my way through a lot of the problems in the 2019 bear market. But this time around, it's about building an organization, which in some ways is a lot more fun because you're dealing with people, but it also sucks way more because like people are that deterministic the way code is. But it's building the organization that's building the product. Uh, and and I think that that's, that's a fun frontier, especially for me as a software engineer and um, organizations are, are way different and more complex, but also more powerful than, than code can be. So uh, in a way, that's, that's your product, not, not just your product. For sure. Yep. I, I like that a lot. All right. Should we close it out Sounds by doing great. Some, yeah. some hand movements? <laughs> and a little bit of bow tie stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You should see it, Anon. You should see it. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Austin. This was fun. Thanks for having me. Always. Let's do it again in another year. All right. We just heard from Austin Griffith. I am excited about Build Guild because I think it is onboarding a lot of developers into the space and also doing some weird, fun capital allocation mechanisms to them. Thanks for listening to the GreenPill.network podcast. Again, we are featuring the people who are building a coordination, a network society of thousands of hackers, dreamers, and doers focused on using crypto to bring positive sound digital systems to the world. People like Austin Griffith and his gaggle of builders in the Build Guild. If you value our work, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review. It really helps us build the regen crypto movement and the Green Pill movement. Thanks again. See you next time. 